for attending one of the last sessions here and for going happy hour. I truly, truly appreciate it, although we can all go to happy hour after this. Um, but welcome to Making Online Collaboration Safer at GitHub. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Amanda, for that. Um, so my name is Danielle Leong. Uh, my handle is DM Leong. That's not my Twitter handle. Uh, if you follow that person, I'm sure she's a very nice person, but that's not me. Um, look for the one with pictures of Scout, um, <laughs> who is my dog right over there, causing trouble. Scout, what are you doing? What are you eating? He's eating something. Anyways, <laughs> um, I am an engineer on the community and safety team. Uh, so a lot of people, when I say I work on community and safety, they're like, uh, so like, are you a real engineer? Like, what exactly is it that you do here? And I help make online communities safer, which then begs the question, what exactly is an online community? Is it just a bunch of users on a website? Is it the customers that we have? No, it's way more than that. Um, and I have a quick little analogy for this. Um, so imagine an online community is kind of like a freeway. Everybody is, ideally, going in the same direction. If you are a lot more experienced, you can be on one side, um, and you know exactly where to go, you know exactly how to get to places. And if you're ramping up, you can go on the side and like, take your time and then eventually merge in with the rest of the community. Uh, now, I ride a motorcycle. This is actually my old motorcycle. Um, and it has two wheels. Um, I have to wear a helmet. I have to wear a lot of gear. It's a very different type of vehicle. But if I turn my blinkers on, uh, I have, <laughs> it doesn't give somebody in a car the right to go all Fury Road and run me off the road just because I look a little bit different. So in an online community and on a freeway, all people have the right to merge. And so as interesting and as fun as it might be to uh, have a lot of road rage and to just push people off because you simply don't like them, it's actually not truly productive for us as a civilization, as a society that does not you know, have water cola all over the place. Um, it's in everybody's best interest if we actually continue moving forward. And so that's why we have rules and regulation and laws and infrastructure that have been built to make sure that we're all going in the same direction. And so community and safety, the team, builds the infrastructure for healthy online communities. And so we build the roads, we, build, we fill in the potholes, we, fill the, we make the signage, but unfortunately, when you have an online community, that means trolls are going to happen. Trolls are going to happen. Trolls are going to come. You build the infrastructure, they're going to find it. And it's just an unfortunate reality in this world that we currently live in. And so I was, when I was researching for this presentation, there is actually no set definition for online harassment. And for something that's so prevalent these days, you would think that there would be a definition that we can all agree on. But unfortunately, there's not. So here at GitHub, we've decided that there's a sound that's going on. Uh, we've defined online harassment as destructive behavior that undermines productivity. At the end of the day, we're all here to build software. We are all here to build products. And online harassment is destructive behavior that distracts people from doing this. If you are getting called racist names day in and day out, you can't focus on doing what's really important, and that is building software. And so there are many different types of online harassment. This is just a, unfortunately, short list of the many different ways that you can make a person's life miserable. For example, posting personal information without their consent, something like social security numbers, your home address, the ages of your children, what schools they go to. These should all be horrifying information that you do not want the general public to know. But there are some awful people out there that think it's fun to post that kind of information. Swatting is another thing that, um, that you can do in order to harass another person, and that is to put in a bomb threat, a fake bomb threat, and tell the SWAT team to go and kick down your door. There's also many, many other different types of harassment, as you can see here. But those are just some of the more harmful ones. 
there's also things called microaggressions, which are these little tiny irritating things day in and day out that people, that minorities, that women, that LGBT folks have to deal with on a daily basis that don't really quantify as severe online harassment, but they're annoying. It's kind of like you're allergic to something and you're like your left eye keeps watering and like no matter what you do, it just keeps watering. It's like being allergic to sexism. And so an example of a microaggression is women are more likely to have their pull requests merged if they hide their gender. So if they don't have an avatar with their name, if they don't have a female sounding name um, in their profile, they are more likely to have their pull requests merged. The second that they reveal their gender, uh, they're actually less likely to have their pull requests merged. And so for all of these statistics, um, I am more than happy to give them out afterwards. I will be in the speaker section after this, so please feel free to find me, um, and I'm happy to give out this information. And age, gender, and sexual orientation are overwhelming factors in who gets chosen to be harassed online. The further away you are from being a straight cisgender, meaning you identify with the gender you are assigned at birth, affluent, able-bodied white male, the more likely you are to be harassed. And this is a term called intersectionality, which means that there are many different layers of oppression that a person can deal with on a daily basis. And we need to make sure that we keep that in mind when we are building out these tools to fight online harassment. So here's a quick, rather depressing list of statistics about who gets harassed. 25% of women 18 to 24 experience severe online harassment as um, defined by the Pew Research Center. Women receive twice as many death and rape threats than men. Considering that one in five women actually get sexually assaulted in their lifetime, these are not idle threats. They're actually very, very scary. 25% of LGBT women suffer serious online harassment, and this has been defined by The Guardian, simply for being who they are. So then that begs the question, who are these jerk faces? Can we just kind of like find them all, shuffle them into a room, and then just kind of make that room disappear somehow? No. There is a stereotype, stereotype, about what these jerk faces look like. And that stereotype is they are a certain body size, that they perhaps live in the basement of their parents' building. Um, perhaps they really only eat Cheetos. These are our stereotypes. They are false. And the people who actually do online harassment are mostly normal people. They look kind of like you and me. Um, and they are doing these things that seem fun at the time, but they have huge implications. You can call somebody a name on the internet, and you're like, they're fine, like, they'll get over it. But if that person is receiving hundreds and thousands of threats every single day, it adds up and that becomes online harassment because it's in aggregate. And this is actually a quote from a Time Magazine article where the author actually was getting harassed day in and day out on Twitter. And the author actually met up with their troll, which is very brave if you ask me, and asked, why, why me? Why, why, are you, why are you bothering me? Um, and they said, I never felt bad. I found your work so vile that I thought you didn't deserve any sympathy. And so unfortunately, today, the internet has kind of erased that people are people. Behind a screen, behind an avatar, there are actually people that are reading all of these messages day in, day out, that might seem harmless when you're by yourself, but again, in aggregate, it becomes something far, far more harmful. And it kind of reminds me of this meme. Uh, once you hate somebody, everybody, everything that they do is offensive. And so once somebody has been targeted simply for being visible, everything that they do is probably offensive in some way, even if they never really meant it, even if they're just eating crackers. And this is a quote by Leslie Jones. She was an actress in the Ghostbusters movie. Her only crime was being a black woman in entertainment. Um, she was harassed off of Twitter. Uh, she came back and she was harassed again, and it was absolutely terrible. And this is important to note, because harassment is no longer about free speech. Harassment is no longer about making your thoughts known. It is done to scare a person. And that is something that we take very seriously here at GitHub, because we do not consider harassment to be free speech, because it's done to scare people. It's also important to note that anytime you have user-to-user -user interactions, there's a possibility of harassment, even on GitHub. That's unfortunate, but we are on the internet, um, and we do have users interacting with one another, which means we have had harassment, and we continue to have it.
even to this day. It's also important to note that targets of harassment are chosen because they are visible. Women holding prominent, visible positions in open source communities are often targets of harassment simply because they exist. So some notable moments of harassment in GitHub history. Um, people have used GitHub repositories and issues to uh, organize doxing, which again is the publishing of public information like social security numbers. There is also an instance of young open, a young open source developer who is targeted with porn and homophobic slurs. That developer was 14 years old. There is also another example of racist repository names. Somebody created a whole bunch of repositories using the N-word and invited a whole bunch of prominent open source developers that showed up on their newsfeed and it looked like they were endorsing it. And there was another incident where people um, were getting spammed with ASCII genitalia. These are all terrible things. I do not condone any of these. But those are the big name things. Those are the things that get in Hacker News. Those are the things where like, it help doesn't care, blah, 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 blah. But there's also examples of microaggressions, as I said before, being allergic to sexism. And so common everyday harassment includes spamming issues in a repository with comments that don't actually mean anything or they're just disruptive. Um, there's also people not pull it, merging in pull requests because the author is a minority. People have also, been, been, have also been spammed with threats that were immediately deleted, but you still get the notification. Um, and people have also created sock puppet accounts, which means they're just creating throwaway accounts in order to dogpile on a person's issue. And they can say, look how many people are, hate this person, when exactly just one person. And so <laughs> with all of these incidents, uh, it, it kind of looks like sometimes GitHub doesn't care because it takes a long time to react to these kinds of things. And it kind of looks like, oh, well, there's, this dumpster is clearly already on fire. Like, there's nothing we can do until it burns out. And that's unfortunate because what was really happening behind the scenes is that there was a lot of internal debate. When exactly do we step in? What are we supposed to do about this? Whose side do we believe in? And a lot of the times it's because there was no set definition of harassment. Like I said, even on the internet, there's no set definition of harassment. And within GitHub, before the creation of the team of community and safety, there was no definition. This led to a lot of internal debate. Also, our support team didn't have the right tools that they needed in order to gain context of what was going on. So they would have to go dig through issues, dig through comments, and see who is right, who is wrong, what is actually happening. And this led to a lot of paralysis. And that paralysis hurt our users. We messed up, and I really want to apologize for the people who are hurt for that, because that's not fair to you. You all want to be here, like you are all actually here, um, and that's not fair for you. Because people were silenced and pushed off the platform, and that's not something that we want. We want people to be able to contribute to open source. We want people to be part of the community that they love, and so that's why we're here, to build better things to help you. And one of those things is we define harassment as not free speech. Legally, it is technically free speech. Uh, but here at GitHub, we want to make sure that we, uh, we want to prioritize users and the user experience over content. And harassment isn't free speech, according to GitHub, because it silences others. We can't collaborate together if people are silenced and shouted off the platform. And again, online harassment is destructive behavior that undermines productivity. We are all here at the end of the day to build great things and collaborate. You can't do that if you're being silenced and pushed off. And so it is our belief that we should build tools that encourage good behavior and not policy to punish bad behavior. It is very good to have a strict policy defining what, uh, what harassment is, but it doesn't really do you any good if you don't have the tools and the moderation um, to really back that up. And so the community and safety team is a core engineering team whose purpose aligns with the company's values of positive social impact. So there are two parts to this that I really want to emphasize. First of all, we are a core engineering team. That means that we are on the same level as the people who, um, who process billing, the people who run the servers. That means that we, uh, we are not a nice to have. We are actually part of, the part, of the part of the company that helps keep the company moving forward. 
And on the second part of this is that our purpose aligns with the company values of positive social impact. And that means that we have executive support all the way to the top. And that is really important because if you have a team that strongly believes in doing something important, that means nothing if they don't have the support all the way. And like I said before, we are a core engineering product, or core engineering team. We're not a nice to have. We are mandatory because you can store your code literally anywhere on the internet. And there are some companies who have made uh, announcements that you can store uh, code on their repositories. But what makes GitHub special is that we have communities. We want to be the premier platform for open source. And if you can't be part of the community, then that's awful. And that's why we want to build tools to help encourage good behavior. And so here are all of the wonderful people that I get to work with. Uh, as you noticed, we don't exactly look like your typical engineering team. And that's because we hire people who have experienced online harassment, who have a different worldview from perhaps your typical engineer. Uh, we are 30, we are 50% uh, women of color. We have 30%. Uh, I can do math. Uh, we have 30% trans women. We have 30% white men. And this is all important because we balance each other's thoughts and experiences and backgrounds together. And so. Our core mission here is to build systems that empower inclusive and healthy communities and encourage good online citizenship. We also want to discourage behavior that is destructive or threatens personal safety. And in order to do that, we want to make sure that we give community managers the tools that they need to succeed. Community Yelly. <laughs> community managers are the people who have the most context for things. We don't want to be the police who get called in and say, like, OK, what's going on here? I'm just going to make a snap decision. Because what's really important is context. People need to have context in order to make a decision about what is actually happening. Community managers are the people who have the most context, and so they should be given the tools in order to best regulate their community. We also want to build explicit consent into every user-to-user -user interaction. Explicit consent is not implicit consent. Uh, an example of this is if you, have, if you receive a notification, if you no longer want to receive that notification, it should be very easy to turn that off. So we are an engineering team, so I'm going to brag a little bit about some of the features we have actually shipped. So Clara Ada, um, she is my teammate. Um, she's a fantastic, fantastic open source developer. Um, and she shipped repository invitations. This is an example of an explicit consent. Uh, so prior to this, she was actually harassed online by somebody who was making racist repository names. She would get added. It would look like she was endorsing a repository with the n-word in it, when in fact she was not. She didn't know that somebody was adding this to, she, someone was adding her to this until it was too late. And then she would have to contact support and have that erased from her newsfeed. That is implicit consent. Explicit consent is you get a shining green button that says, do you want to accept this, uh, this invitation, yes or no? You click yes, you get added to this repository. You click no, I never want to see this person again, then that's also very easy to do. This is something that I shipped, which is um, the ability to see all of the users that you have blocked. Now, blocking has been around since 2011, but not a lot of people knew about it. And once you blocked a person, they just kind of fell off the face of the earth, and you were never really sure if that person was still blocked and they, or if they could still see all the activity that you were doing on GitHub. Now, you have the ability to see all of the people that you have blocked um, and to make sure that there's no sort of patterns in the usernames that uh, ha they have been creating. This is also very similar looking to organizations where it now able to block abusive users. So if a user is spamming perhaps the jQuery library with comments and issues that really were destructive, um, that person could be blocked from the jQuery organization. Uh, Kat, who is our product designer, also took a deep dive into what does it look like to block a person? What does it mean if you no longer want to see that person? What are all the holes that we have missed? Um, and so how can we make it easier for, pe for people to interact with the people that they truly do want to interact with? And so she, said she made a lot of really great um, changes to the, um, the ability to block a person. Community and safety also consults 
with on feature reviews in order to catch potential abuse vectors. Uh, now, I make no promises, but uh, we are pinged on a lot of feature review or feature. Uh, features before they go out, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to catch things that are potential abuse factors before they go out, before they start hurting people. Um, and so that's part of the review process uh, before major products are shipped out. We've done that with a couple of the features you've seen here today, um, and I make no promises. It is possible we will catch stuff, but at least we have a team who have been harassed on the internet before looking at products before they go out. Because you know it's 2016, the internet is part of our daily lives, and if you're not asking the question, how can this be used to hurt people, then you're not asking all of the questions. So in the works, this is not this is not the end-all, be-all. We are going to continue shipping things. Um, one of the things that we are working on are repository reputation system. So if you've ever been part of an open source project and somebody, some, one person says. Oh, you should do this. And another person says, no, 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 like I think that this, this uh, solution is better. Which person's opinion should you be taking? Which person is actually a trusted member of the community? And who is a sock puppet account that has just created a throwaway account to lead you in the wrong direction? So a repository re reputation system will hopefully be able to clear that up and you can see who is a maintainer and who is a brand new person. We also want to build tools that measure and encourage code of conduct adoption rates. Uh, community and safety team, we're huge fans of codes of conduct. Uh, that means it's just a, a list of, of uh, behaviors that we expect our users to do. Uh, we define what online harassment is, and we want to make sure that all of our communities are also defining what that looks like. We also want to do site-wide community guidelines that define harassment. Like I said before, Paralysis happened because we had no set definition of online harassment. Very soon, we will. This is just basically going to be a code of conduct that is site-wide. We also want to provide crisis management tools for community managers. Again, community managers have the most context, so if somebody needs to just be put on a timeout for 24 hours, we want to be able to provide that for them. I know who the Steven Universe fans are here. <laughs> so what does my ideal GitHub look like in the future? Communities at GitHub are safe and inclusive and composed of diverse users acting as model online citizens. Now, I've used the term model online citizens a couple of times. And what does that actually mean? It means that we are not jerk faces. We respect one another as people and contribute meaningful work. That's it. Just be decent human beings towards one another. We also want to build enthusiastic and informed consent into every interaction. Again, racist repository names were an example of implicit consent. We want explicit consent for every user-to-user -user interaction. We also want to reward good behavior. We are not here to police behavior. We are also not here to censor people. We are here to encourage people to get along. We are here to encourage people to have uh, productive uh, conversations with another and to collaborate. And we don't want to just punish bad behavior. We also want to encourage people to be good people towards one another and to make really amazing things. We also want to make sure that curiosity and learning is encouraged without the fear of ridicule. I don't know how long it's been since it's been your first pull request, but it is a really, really scary thing to do that. Um, if you don't know the organization that you're contributing to, if you're still pretty new in your coding career, it can be incredibly timid intimidating, and we want to make this as easy and friendly as possible. We also want to give community managers the tools to de-escalate de de situations and foster inclusive cultures. We don't want dumpster fires. We want you to be able to contain an incident before it gets out of hand, before it becomes something that consumes your entire community. So a couple of concluding thoughts. Harassment happens anytime you have user-to-user -user interaction. Ignoring it does not make it go away, as with most things in life. Uh, but we want to make sure that we tackle harassment head on and that we acknowledge that it does happen and acknowledge that we are building tools to fight it. We are here to build tools that align with company values. It goes all the way to the top. Uh, building policy really doesn't mean anything unless you have the tools to back up what you are building. And communities that purport to be for everyone have an obligation 
to cultivate a community of inclusive values, a space where participants aren't silenced by fear or shouted down. We at GitHub here, uh, we want the open source community to thrive. And so it's our obligation to make sure that everybody who wants to contribute is able to contribute and is able to be heard. So that's a little bit about our team, the community and safety team. We are here to fill in all of the potholes and to make sure that everybody is able to get to their proper destination. Uh, and here's a list of the resources. If you are interested in learning more about the statistics that I posted earlier, please feel free to find me. I'm the one with the dog. Uh, and that is about it. Thank you so much for coming.